This is Trophy Dark, Gift of the Sea. My name is Jason. I want to begin by having all of us introduce ourselves. And then after we do that, um, we will begin some introductory stuff. Uh, when I call on you, please say your name, uh, your pronouns, and anything else you'd like for us to know about you. I will start. My name is Jason. I use he, him. They is also fine. I am the publisher of Trophy and uh, the founder of an organization called The Gauntlet. Um, and if you are interested in Trophy, if you're watching this video, we will have a link to the, um, the pre-order page for you in the show notes. Okay, so let's go over to Daniel. Um, I'm Daniel Qualls, he, him. Um, I'm a forever DM, and I was trying to think the last time I played, and I think it was in the 90s, and Rich Rogers, uh, who's, uh, who, who works with a podcast on Gauntlet, he was, uh, he was the uh, referee. Yeah, which is great. Um, let's go to Michael. He, him. Um, I've been playing pen and paper games since high school, uh, second ed and uh, Vampire the Masquerade. Um, and I'm currently running a uh, The Between campaign for my friends. So uh, I awesome. got really excited. Love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Love to hear that. Um, also, Michael, I noticed there's like a one and a half second delay between when you pressed mute and began and we could hear you. So just be aware of that if you're using your mic. Um, okay. Anything. Uh, let's go to Ryan. Hi, uh, I'm Ryan. Uh, he, him. Um, I've been playing role play games for probably just uh, like maybe four years now. I started with fifth edition D&D uh, &D and uh, have been branching out since then. And yeah, uh, excited to be here. Fabulous. Thank you all so much. So I'm going to begin with a procedure called CATS. CATS is an acronym that stands for concept, aim, tone, and subject matter. The reason why I do CATS is to establish some basic expectations for what we're going to be doing this week and next week. And so let's start with the concept of Trophy Dark. Trophy Dark is a fantasy horror game with an emphasis on the horror. Um, it has a lot of the trappings of like classic fantasy games, uh, you know, fantasy adventure games, but it is in fact pretty squarely focused on horror and the experience of these characters who are sort of doomed. They are going to, um, I mean, they're, they're not likely to be dead by the end, but they're definitely gonna be changed by the end and it's probably not for the better. And um, so the game asks you as players to sort of really embrace this, like what we, what we Trophy HQ called a play to lose ethos, right? Like you, we want, we want, your, your characters are going to lose and it's going to be fun and we're going to have a lot of fun seeing them lose, right? So that's kind of the idea. Um, Gift of the Sea is one of the incursions that's in the core Trophy Dark book. And I don't want to say more about it than that, except that I will say that it's um, written by Gabriel Robinson and it features, I don't know, to me, it's, it, to me, it's like the movie Midsommar, but like, but like on the ocean. <laughs> so it's like Midsommar on the ocean. So that's, that's the way I like to refer to it. And yeah, let's talk about aim. So the aim of uh, the characters is to acquire treasure. They are treasure hunters. They each have a drive that like pushes them to try to, uh, to acquire relics and uh, coinage and anything else they can get their hands on in order to turn into uh, money to help fuel and pay for their drive, this very expensive thing that is that is driving them. Um, it's their motivation. It, um, in, in, in doing so, they sort of like push into places that basically are places that like don't want them there, right? <laughs> like, and so as they go into these places that don't want them there, uh, they suffer the full brunt of that, uh, of that place. The aim of us as players is to tell a good story, of course, but also to explore who these characters are. They start quite sketchy in the beginning. We don't know much about them and that's intentional. And we sort of learn as we go. Um, through the role play, through questions that I pose to you, um, through the way you react to different things, um, to any flashbacks you might be able to tell us as we play, that kind of thing. In the beginning, you're not gonna know too much about them and that's okay. Uh, we, part of the, well, the aim of the game is to learn about them as we play. Um, our aim specifically today is to uh, make characters. And then after we make characters, we will introduce them. We'll take a little break and then we'll come back and we will do the first two rings of the incursion. The incursions have five rings. Uh, we'll do ring three, four, and five next week. 
after we're done today, we'll do a little debrief as well. The tone of the game, as you might imagine, is dark um, and dark and kind of uh, usually it's pretty bleak as well. Like it has like a very like emotional bleakness to it. Uh, this one is not quite so much that way, um, but it definitely has a sort of a, a darkness, but it's a darkness that takes place in full daylight. It's like a full daylight darkness and horror, right? More emotional in nature, I guess. In terms of subject matter, um, helpfully, the incursions tell us all the uh, <laughs> subject matter that comes up. And this one has a body horror, uh, drowning, human sacrifice is a big one, religion, sharks, shipwrecks, and storms. Uh, we are going to have three safety tools on the table today and next week. Those three safety tools are the X card, the open door policy, and lines and veils. I will talk about those now. I'll start with the open door policy. It's the easiest. Basically, you can leave for any reason. You don't have to explain yourself. If you have to go, you just tell us you're going, and that's, that's good enough. The X card in the context of this video call, if something happens in the game that you find to be, mm, I like to say it, it makes you uncomfortable in an unfun way because you can be comfortable in a fun way, right? If it makes you uncomfortable in an unfun way, if it just sort of clashes with your idea of like what you thought was gonna be happening, um, you can just say X card or type it in the chat and I will uh, stop play. I may ask what specifically is being X carded, but I won't ask why. And then lines and veils, that's my sort of preferred uh, safety tool. Lines are things that we are not going to have in the game at all. They're just simply not gonna be part of the story. Veils are things that we're okay with being in the story, we just prefer not to role play it. There is a tab on the character keeper that says safety. Um, at some point, preferably at the first break, if you'll just go through here and do your lines and veils, just mark things, that would be great. Um, you also have the option to put an ask first um, as well. So I'm gonna say mine though, just so you know how it works. My uh, line that I always have in games is sexual violence. I just prefer not to have that in my stories and so we're not gonna do it. And so I will line that. My veil is going to be torture. I don't mind if torture is a thing in the story, I just prefer not to role play the torture. So that's lines and veils and that is cats. Do you all have any questions about anything that I've said so far? In that case, let's talk about character creation. So character creation in Trophy is really easy um, and very fast. You basically have four choices to make and um, you, have a, you have your little columns here. Everybody just grab a column by putting your player name in there somewhere. Or well, actually there's a little space for player name. And you're gonna pick your character's name, their occupation, their background, their drive, and then up to three rituals. Now depending on how many rituals you choose, that increases what's called your ruin score. And if you ever hit ruin six, your character is lost to the, uh, well, normally to the woods, in this case, it's to the ocean, but, or to the sea. Um, so if you take two rituals, your starting ruin is two. If you take three, it's three. And if you take, uh, or if you take two, it's, wait, I'm getting all confused now. It's, number of rituals plus one, that's your starting ruin. So you can have zero as well, if you wish. Um, there is a way once you hit five ruin to like go back down. So it's not the end of the world if you start a little high. It just means that the betrayal will be beginning much earlier. <laughs> so uh, bear that in mind. In any case, uh, go ahead and start making your character. And at this point, I'm going to pause the video for anybody who's watching so they don't have to watch us make characters. Okay, we're back. So we're gonna introduce these characters. Um, I'm gonna go in reverse order of the sheet. At this point, I just want the basics, name, occupation, background, drive, skills, and rituals, basically just go down the, <laughs> go down the sheet. Um, if you know something about your backstory at this point or anything particularly related to your drive that you think might be interesting for, for us, if you know that now, you can certainly tell us, um, but it's okay if you don't, because like I said, we're gonna learn it over the next two weeks. So I'm going to go in reverse order, and I'll start with Daniel and um, Milo or Milo. 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 All right, tell us about Milo. Milo is a currently a um, a, um, a smuggler. He's uh, he's in this uh, whatever this community is. 
He uh, he was stranded here as a as a grounded sailor is his background, and so he's been he's been using his uh, his nautical skills to set up a smuggling ring. And what he's trying to do is um, is finance an expedition to the Blossoming Sea. And so he he does not have a ship. He might have access to some small skiff or something, but he wants a ship and a crew. And no 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 rituals because he's superstitious. And for skills, you have dexterity, spontaneity, stealth, and ropes. I love it. And starting root of one. Okay, good. Um, I don't have any questions. And I probably won't as we start. But if anybody does have any questions about any of the characters, just chime in. Let's go to Michael and hmm, Hil Hiltrude? <laughs> Hiltrude? <laughs> yes, Hil Hiltrude. Hiltrude. Um, so Hiltrude is an escaped cultist. Um, she is currently a medium and she's in seek of, um, the, the artifact that will, will basically show the King's true nature. I, I envision something of an entanglement between the former cult she was in and the King, um, something like, uh, uh, you know, a, a tit for tat or, you know, he was manipulating something or another using the cult. So that's kind of where I thought of that. Fabulous. I love it. Um, and you have taken, okay, so your background in occupation give you spirits, vigilance, willpower, and deception. I love that. And what rituals have you taken? Um, I took haunt and liar. Okay, great. Liar's interesting. I've never had liar in a game. It says, contact a spirit who can answer any question, but only falsely. <laughs> yeah, I had a real labyrinth vibe to it, so I had to jump on it. I'm super, I know, I know, I know the thing <laughs> you're talking about, too. That's pretty good. Um, Okay, I guess that requires, it's going to require me to be kind of like a, a puzzle, a puzzler in a way, maybe, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, fabulous. So I, I will tell you that like, the way I run rituals is they, they don't always, they don't always get, they don't always necessarily have to have a die roll associated with them. Sometimes depending on the circumstances or the scenario, especially if there's nothing at risk, um, you can just use your ritual to do the thing. And I think that's okay. So just kind of bear that in mind, everybody. Um, fabulous. Thank you. Let's go to Ryan and Foray. Foray, Foret. Foret. Um, yeah. Foret is an antiquarian um, and a hapless, a hapless peddler um, of those um, items of antiquity, uh, whose drive is to restore the Temple of Tanaholt. We'll find out about more about what that's about later, I think. Um, my skills are artifacts, myths, obfuscation, and trading. Um, and I took two rituals, maze and scale. Maze is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've ever had that in a game either. These are very interesting rituals, scale. I think part of the reason why I've never had some of these though is because I haven't used this character keeper yet. I've been using the old, <laughs> the old one that only has like five to choose from. <laughs> so that could be why. Um, I'm getting to experience this game in a whole new way. It's great. Um, I love it. Okay, so we have our three characters, you know, a little sketchy still, and that's okay. Throughout the game, I'm gonna be asking you all a lot of questions. And sometimes you may not know the answer right away, and my advice to you in that instance is to, um, A, go with the answer that's the simplest. Um, sometimes that's the best answer and don't feel too nervous about that, just do it. Or you should think about your drive. Your drive should always be kind of the touchstone for your character. We've only got two sessions with these characters and then they're, they're, they're done. And so pour as much of your character development into your drive and what your drive means. And that's my, my best piece of advice as far as that goes. I don't think I have any other questions at this point though about the characters. And so I think what I'm gonna do is go ahead and introduce the incursion, Gift of the Sea, and then we'll take a little break after that. So let's talk about Gift of the Sea. No, we're not, I'm changing my mind. I wanna talk about one rules thing since you're all new Trophy Dark players. The thing about this game is it's, it's very collaborative. And so unlike 
a more traditional uh, role playing game where the GM sort of dispenses a lot of the story to you. This is not that way. This is a very, very highly collaborative game. I have a very skeletal structure with the incursion of sort of what's going to happen. It's just a basic through line of what's going to happen. But there's so much space in the middle to, to fill in, right? And you will be frequently tasked with filling that space in. And the sort of main way this happens is through a die roll, the principal die roll, which is called the risk roll. Now, the risk roll has this feature called the devil's bargain. And this is the really, really, really fun part of Trophy Dark. Because what the devil's bargain is, is it's a essentially like everybody at the table, when you're doing something risky and getting ready to take a die roll, everybody at the table gets to make you an offer uh, to give you dice. So it's like, okay, if you take this deal, this fictional deal that I'm making, then you can have the die, right? And these offers are things that happen in the story no matter what, whether you succeed or fail at the die roll. And so as an example, let's say for, let's say that, let's say that Hiltrude is jumping across a crevasse, right? And that's a risk roll and it gets to the devil's bargain part and someone offers a devil's bargain, no matter what, Hiltrude, your weapon is going to fall down the crevasse. So if you succeed, it just slips out of your hand as you jump across. If you fail, it falls down the crevasse because you also fall down the crevasse, right? And so that's, that's a devil's bargain, right? It's a simple one, but it's fine. A more interesting devil's bargain might be, well, no matter what, on the other side of the crevasse, there is a representative of the king. Now that's interesting for Hiltrude because Hiltrude's drive is find the artifact that proves the king's true nature, right? And so straight away, we have a connection with Hiltrude's um, uh, backstory and, and drive and motivation, right? So when you're offering a devil's bargain, maybe think about ways you can sort of help explore that character's story, right? It's kind of your opportunity to do that. Or keep it simple, you drop your weapon, that's fine too. But in any case, the devil's bargain and other things in the game, but really principally the devil's bargain is how we, we change the story, we shape the story. It, it takes the story in strange new directions, wild new directions frequently that no one anticipated, neither me, neither Gabriel, the author of the incursion or other players at the table foresaw. And that's what's cool and fun. So just kind of keep that in mind. Okay, so that's my one note about rules. Now I will introduce the incursion, get to the sea. And like so many Trophy Dark incursions, it begins with a poem. Who knows what secrets dwell beneath the ocean, vast and wide, or what became of those who tried to fight the turning tide? The night is dark, the storm is fierce, but nothing should we fear. Come round and light the candles bright, for spring is almost here. We bind the saplings wreathed in green, as folk did long before. We crown a maiden as our queen, we cast her from the shore. For as the land gives gifts to those who sow and reap the grain, the sea in turn must have its due when greed tide comes again. O mother of the endless tides, O queen of depths unseen, accept these humble gifts we bring upon your mantle green. Fill up your nets with gleaming fish and spare our sailors brave. For all the rest, take what you must beneath the rolling wave. Now, beyond the forest lies a jagged rocky coast where for generations now, a small seaside village has observed the rites of green tide. Each spring, as the first green shoots emerge, village elders weave sapling branches and seaweed into an effigy in the likeness of a young woman. The sculpture is filled with gifts before it is cast into the waves as an offering to the queen of tides, along with prayers for a bountiful catch and protection from storms. Now this ancient tradition harkens back to an age when the ancestors would crown a young woman as the tide queen and offer her to the sea in sacrifice. 
Chieftains and princes would travel far to attend the ceremony, pledging gold, jewels, and the finest of crafts. To this day, local fishermen never leave shore without paying her their respects, for the tide, they say, must have its due. Strange as the customs of an isolated village may be, it has not escaped the notice of keen treasure hunters such as yourselves that centuries of offerings and shipwrecks have left a great hoard of untouched riches beneath the waves. You know of the island offshore where the offerings are tipped overboard. You have heard rumors of a cove there, just visible at low tide. Superstitious villagers avoid it, but you know better than to believe their tales. And the theme of this incursion is tides. The tide is low, the tide's coming in, the tide's receding, the tide's coming in, it's happening the whole time. And tides here are not just the physical tides, they are a symbolic tide. Things are revealed, and things are covered up and then revealed, right? So in short, you are all going to this village that is getting ready to celebrate green tide but you're gonna try to get yourself over to that island where you believe there's a cove where these treasures are, have been accumulating over the years, okay? So with all that said, let's take a quick five minute break. We'll come back and we'll begin. Ring one, the tide is low, waiting to rise and meet the shore as you approach the village. A question for each of you, a two-part question. Are you from a coastal area? If not, how is this place different, this little seaside town, seaside village? How's it different from where you're from? If it's not different from where you're from, what reminds you of home? Think on it for a moment. And whoever has an answer, speak. I'm going to say it's uh, different. I am from a seaside town, as a, with my with my background as a sailor, but this is way uh, more whatever the whatever the word for coastal this rural and 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 Milo is used to a more urban an ur urban setting with shipping and whatnot. So this is off the beaten path and kind of remote. Good. Uh, for it, any ideas? Yeah, I think this is uh, very different from where they grew up. Um, and I think what's maybe uh, uncomfortable about it would be the shifting nature of the tides and um, maybe the shoreline uh, and just a, a sense of like, fluidity and impertinence. Hildred? Um, I was thinking uh, she comes from a landlocked kingdom. And um, so it is different in the sense that there is a um, constant smell of salt air and, um, and uh, sea life, which is dis uh, uh, dis disarming. I like it. Michael, I'm gonna give you a chance to roll your physical dice. <laughs> roll me a um, roll me a d6. Five. Five. You all have heard tales of the horrors at sea, which await those who cross it carelessly. I have. There are several things you've heard. And one of the things you've heard is that there is a sunken watchtower in this particular part of the sea, perhaps even very near this town. And this sunken watchtower at one time lured ships to their doom. And the rumors suggest that the spirits of the drowned sailors are trapped in that sunken watchtower. Now Milo, 
you're a former sailor. You have almost certainly heard these rumors, these tales. Why do you suspect there's some truth to it? Because this uh, sunken watchtower has got a brass cap, solid, solid brass, and you can't see it under, you can't see it above the surface, uh, especially when it's dark. And so I've heard tales of uh, ships well, that are head, heavy laden with goods crashing into the tip of the sunseen lighthouse, cutting them right open and spilling all their wares into the sea. So it's not a matter so much the ships were like mystically lured there. They, they, they just literally ran aground on it. Does that what happened? <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, tales are told. We spin tales to explain things. Interesting. A question for Hiltrude, because you have the skill of spirits. Hiltrude, when you first arrived in this land, what made you think that there might actually be trapped spirits? There might actually be tormented spirits around? Um, where most people hear a, um, where most people hear the wind passing through, um, Hiltrude can hear uh, kind of wails and, and desperation on the wind of, uh, of those lost uh, to the tower and, and to the area. I like it. You are approaching this village. You can hear in the distance preparations for this green tide festival, you've, which is the sort of reason why you're all here. Laughter, sort of um, children running around, you know, things like that. As you approach the village, an old man, probably an old fisherman, he sort of is approaching you. At first you thought he was just a gnarled piece of driftwood propped up against a rock until it started moving. <laughs> and then you realize that he's a man and he's getting closer to you and he sort of hobbling over and he says to you, I have seen the likes of you before. You all have the look of people here to seek the riches of her sea. Have I guessed it correctly? I seek no riches other than to set my people free. To set your people free. What sort of bondage do they find themselves in? The most common kind, bondage of the king. Uh, <laughs> you should move here, out to the rocky rural coast. The king's guard has no love for this place. King's reach stretches not quite far enough to reach us. You look like you could perhaps handle a fishing rod or a net if it came right down to it. He looks at you for it. And you, are you trying to evade the royal grasp? Um, I uh, care not for the the whims of um, temporal rulers and kings, but more of uh, restoring the glory of Tanalot. Uh, um, I believe an uh, artifact of great worth was lost and uh, cast into the sea here. No doubt great many artifacts are to be found near here beneath the waves the ancient tide kings and tide queens were most rigorous in their observation of the old ways many many treasures were given people from distant lands came 
to make their offerings so that their own ships might receive fair passage from the Queen of Tides. He says, I know the location of a hidden cove, a hidden cove on that great island where we'll all be headed this evening. Perhaps you could use the location of this cove and perhaps I could give it to you for a price. What price could possibly interest you? <laughs> what have you got? I am a cheap date. And here you can just make something up if you have something interesting or a value you think you might have. Um, I have a, let's see, on my persons, I have a um, sound maker used to communicate with the spirits, um, generally used when less sensitive people are present. And I, I remove it and hold it out for him to see. Yes. What an interesting little toy. I do wonder if it will take me back to my childhood, running about um, for it has probably a cloak with uh, that jingles quite a lot when it's moved around um, with different trinkets and uh, charms attached to it um, and pulls out some um, medallions that are of not necessarily any monetary worth but um, are certainly interesting to look at um, and perhaps these uh, might suit your fancy. Perhaps they might, perhaps they might. It is all a bit noisy for my taste. I rather appreciate my ability to walk quietly among the people. You yourselves didn't even know I was here until I began to approach you. Why should I give up? The element of surprise. What about you, friend? Do you have an adequate payment? Well, all I really have is this uh, um, really kind of floral looking paper. And I, I planned on using this to uh, fashion a boat to send to the, uh, to send to the sea as an offering. Um, I could show you how to make this boat. Mm. That is an interesting payment indeed. Show me how to make this boat and I will vouch for you in the village. I make a boat that looks kind of like a hat <laughs> and then turn it upside down and put some, put some grass in it for sails. This will go straight out to the queen. You have the hands of a sailor friend. Have you lived for a time on the waters of the Great Tide Mother? I have. And yet you are here alive. You must certainly have her favor, her blessing. I wish I could say that. Perhaps she was most amused by your little boats. He will take you to the village. You're going at his pace though, which is perhaps a bit slower than you would like. Nevertheless, when you arrive at the village, it is full of revelry for the Green Tide Festival. On the shore, the elders of the village are crafting an effigy of a very tall woman her features taking form as seaweed and reeds are woven over a crude driftwood skeleton. As they sort of are erecting this effigy, songs are being sung. The songs themselves, a sort of offering 
a way of sending the sacrifice down into the deep sea. Offerings are being placed inside the effigy as well. Flowers and ribbons are being woven into her kelp hair. The ritual most people would say is strangely mesmerizing to watch and the final result equally beautiful and unsettling. From your distance here, you're not that close, you are still about a hundred paces away. But from your distance, looking upon the effigy, do you feel the presence of the divine or do you feel deeply unsettled? A combination of both. How, how does the ocean look? Like, is the tide in? Tide is low and present. I think I feel disconcerted. Why? Because uh, we're doing all the, the 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 town is doing all this for the for the for the queen and or the tides, and it's not yet seen. So I'm anticipating like some arrival. Interesting. Phil Trude, as you gaze upon the effigy, how does it make you feel? Uh, I feel calm. Hiltrud feels calm, like it's um, understandable what they're going for. Uh, you say wood effigy, and I, I picture, uh, I have to picture um, bees uh, as part of it, you know, the bringer of, bringer of uh, flowers, but also, you know, not the bees. Uh, so yeah, there's there's um, there's bees in there and things like that, which I, I know are to communicate with the um, with the, the season and the and the comings of uh, of of the season. Ooh, interesting. For um, I think uh, it adds to the sense of uh, like um, uncertainty and and. Um, uh, just like unsettledness of everything the effigy looks um maybe ferrets sort of started to lose their sight a little and at a distance um it almost looked real especially with as the light maybe reflects from the from the shore um and uh can't quite make out you know at a moment it's it's uh it's real and then at the moment it's obviously um uh, construction so um a little uh Confusing and um, scary. Thank you. So you're approaching and the old man sort of breaks off to go chat with whatever friends he has in the village. And you can see some motioning backwards towards you all. And you generally feel like you're being welcomed here. I think that some of the little children will run up to you and, you know, ask you if you have candy or things like that, right? And perhaps some of the, some of the men and women will, you know, sort of greet you. Blessings of green tide, blessings of green tide, right? And there's a feast. And you're welcome to the feast. And the feast is quite um, uh, joyous. There's no, this is not some somber affair. There are people, you know, kids running around this long table. There are dishes being laid out, mostly fish, different fish dishes. Things all being sort of laid out. And you're all invited to participate. You learn very quickly that as soon as the sun is fully down, then the actual sort of ceremony, ceremony will take place. People will make their final offerings and then the effigy will be brought out to sea. But just at the outset here, this little celebration, I'm just curious what you're doing. I'll start with for it. Um, for it's probably wandering around and uh, this is after the feast. 
Uh, kind of in the middle of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe it's quickly um, eaten their portion and uh, gotten up and um, probably has tried to pay attention and maybe make a mental um, inventory of what sort of little treasures may have been brought as offerings um, to see um, if I recognize anything or um, what may be, you know, of interest. Um, and perhaps even pocketing some silverware here and there. Um, you never know when it might be useful. Very good. Tell me about Tamalot. Is this, a, when we say Temple of Tanalot, is that is that a god or is that a place? What do we think? I think I think it's a, yeah, a god of a specific place. Um, maybe not my home, but um, somewhere that uh, I sought refuge at. Um, perhaps, maybe um, the temple was ruined um, and I found shelter there um, and maybe read uh, text or scrolls or something that I found um, and was convinced to restore the treasures that were lost to bring it back, like bring the power back to the temple. Interesting. Hmm. Milo, what are you doing during the celebration, during the feast? I'm enjoying it and uh, partaking of the of, of beverages and, and, and the food, but I'm, uh, I'm keeping a keen eye on the, um, on the docks uh, the part of the the part of the village that um, that holds the ship, their whatever kind of fishing boats that they have, and and try, just trying to size up what kind of craft they may have. What kind of yeah, craft. I'll tell you that they are they're preparing. So essentially, this they're the only craft they have are just like small fishing boats, essentially. You know, little at most two men. You know, or maybe maybe the, in, in the bigger ones, maybe three or four people, but like just small little fishing crafts. They're all being gathered uh, essentially to one spot, very near where the effigy is. It seems like this is meant to be a procession of some sort that goes out, you know, uh, with the effigy. And as a little sort of paint the scene question for everyone, that's well, not really a pincing question, but just a question for everyone. How are these fishing boats, how are they decorated or changed for the ritual? What do you notice? Um, they have large, uh, long garlands of flowers um, strewn across the sides, um, uh, just adornments uh, all over the hall of flowers. With, uh, with some makeshift paint, that, that, that's washing off even now, but uh, up, uh, on the edge of the boats uh, facing us, uh, we can see they painted little um, crude sea life, like little fishes and, and, and just different type of sea life along the edge. Um, perhaps uh, along with the sea life, maybe accompaniments of um, like former princesses or things that may have been sacrificed or um, depictions of the effigy being sacrificed to the ocean. That's really interesting. You might notice for it that these paintings, the effigy seems a little more animated uh, in the painting. Arms look of distress <laughs> as they're being tossed into the ocean. Hiltrude, what are you doing in the middle of the celebration? Um, I picture Hiltrude having a harder time with maybe um, corporeal pleasures, um, if that makes sense. So she's not eating a lot of food. Um, she is uh, has has taken out a, a a small bag of marbles that contain um, fairy lights and is handing them out to the children, um, but is a a dual purpose. Um, it actually attracts. Um, spirits uh, to to the um, to the vicinity to the area to to um, uh, for her to be able to kind of commune with. Right now, she feels being a little away from the the tower where all the the spirits have you know uh, communed and everything. She feels a little alone uh, among all these people. Oh, interesting. Hmm. There's someone else there. 
who also seems very alone. A woman sitting on a large sort of, large like kind of wood, piece of wood. Her face and her hands, the occasional gasp. She's crying. And I think your sensitivity to spirits sort of might even like tell you that this is, this is quite intense grief. What do you do? Um, I approach her um, cautiously, um, holding out a hand um, with three marbles with fairy lights. And I say, um, when we lose, what we lose is never truly gone. And sometimes it only takes a little beacon. And I hand her some of the marbles. I hand her the marbles. She takes them and she wipes tears from her eyes. She has a very weathered look, quite leathery skin, visible salt stains in her hair and clothes. And she says, I know that what you speak is true. And yet my heart aches for her nonetheless. As quiet as we may be on the outside, our, our souls are never truly silent. So. The place gets much more somber. The children are sat down in rows on benches and made to be quiet. The adults don robes of seafoam green and people are invited to join a line before the effigy. people have in their hands for it, their offerings that they are going to put in the effigy. They are going to insert inside the driftwood or otherwise tie to it in some way. The village elders will invite you, newcomers, if you wish to make an offering, you may do so and everyone sort of gets in line. Do you get in line to make an offering? And if so, what do you offer? I um, have a uh, really polished uh, purple seashell. It's kind of a spiral seashell. And is there some kind of cavity that they put of the, of the effigy that they're putting these things in? Yeah, yeah, there's like a, yeah, essentially, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I placed this polished uh, seashell in there. Um, well, before you get to the, I just want to know what you're placing there. I oh, yeah, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> polished seashell, good, I like that. Hiltrude, are you going to make an offering? Uh, yes, uh, she takes from her robe a um, a weathered skull, um, slightly uh, smaller in size. Um, that has been painted with a um, an almost um, bioluminescent paint, um, and I'm I'm assuming that everybody kind of gives her strange looks. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. Although most people will probably view it as a very worthy gift, right? Yeah, because surely something that glows like that will lead her down to the lair of the Queen of Tides. For it, do you make an offering? Um, I think uh, 
a part of me wants to, um, just because um, sort of I've been sort of wrapped up in um, in the moment, uh, but maybe can't quite bring myself to part with any of my valuables just yet. Very good. Milo, you're standing in the line. Everyone makes their offerings. It's dark. There are just a few tiki torches kind of lining the lane or the path. And you see the effigy standing, towering tall, right? This shape of a woman with kelp for hair and all manner of ribbons and baubles festooning her body. You get to the front of the line, Milo, to make your offering and you can't get too close to the effigy. There's a, there's a, there's a, an elder who sort of will take your offering over to the effigy and put it in for you. The elder, an old man with a beard with tiny seashells woven in it. He says, you are very wise outsider to make an offering. to she below the waves. What gift do you have to give? Something that belongs to her. And I, I, I hold up the, the purple seashell. Yes. She is always most pleased when her treasures are returned to her. And he takes the polished seashell and he walks over to the effigy it's very quiet you can hear milo because you're at the front of the line you can hear in the darkness from where the effigy is it's just barely illuminated by the torchlight you can hear from the shadows <laughs> and you hear the elder say, Shh, as he places the shell. Milo, please make a ruin roll. Go to the die roller and do forward slash ruin. Six, your ruin is definitely going up. It goes up to two, in fact. This means you're going to get a condition. We'll talk about that condition in a moment. But I do wanna know, how does this make you feel? In particular, why does it feel like the Tide Queen is getting just claws just a little more sunk into you it makes me feel scared because uh even though i'm superstitious um part of me really didn't want to believe just it's just uh, the culture of, of being a sailor it's just it's just what the sailors say and i don't really believe it um it's just part of the uh it's just part of the culture but uh but i'm starting to i'm starting to feel like uh my trip to the blossoming sea really depends on this and it's starting to make me scared that she may stop me if I anger her. Hiltrud, you reach the front of the line. The elder approaches you. He says, this is a fine, fine gift indeed. It will glow bright 
beneath the waves, like a lantern in the dark, the offering will be able to find its way back to her briny bosom. If I may, I, I lean into the elder and say, um, it's it's a little more than that. It's it's also a companion. Oh. And do tell what sorts of strange magics does this object possess? It's um the best way to describe it would be a vessel. Probably not unlike what you're used to here. Well, we simply craft the effigy. It is the queen of tides that fills it with spirit. And he takes this as a skull, right? Correct. He takes the skull. And who is the skull of? Is it just a skull? <laughs> or it's it... it's it's a Whose human skull, skull. Was it? <laughs> yeah, it's a human skull. It is um it is like I said, smaller than normal, but it is um it's an anonymous skull. It's mm. Just one she's come upon in her travels. Mm. And he approaches this even more shadowy than before effigy. The light plays off the drifted in a way that it almost it almost looks like when sunlight is piercing through the surface of water. The way the shafts sort of dance around, except it's quite dark. And he approaches and he says, You see this little baby, a little baby of the sea. And you hear this response. Like, oh, for it, you notice something perhaps of more immediate interest. Actually, no, Hiltrude, give me a drone roll as well, Hiltrude. Oh, I thought I'd escaped it. All right. <laughs> uh, you're not escaping it that easy. You also got a six. You're also going up. How does it make you feel? Um, it's, 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 it's touching Heltrude in a way that is not what she's used to when dealing with spirits. It's, it's, it's cold. Um, spirits are usually warm to her. And in this case, this is whatever, whatever's going on here, whatever dark magics are at, at hand. Um, it, it chills her, uh, all along her spine. Thank you for it. You have a different perspective on things, I think. You've already indicated to us that you're keeping an eye out for valuables. You are on the clock, <laughs> which is good. You will notice that a couple of fishermen, perhaps a couple of fishermen who are not as deep into the green tide ritual, you see them hoisting A chest between them. Not a big chest, probably only like the size of a bread box, but it must be filled with something very quite heavy because it takes two people to lift it. And you can see them like sort of carrying it and they're going back to a hut and they come out of the hut without the chest. What do you do? Um. I think it's very obvious that I um, wait until I feel like um, the attention has gone away from them or, um, you know, uh, nobody's looking and I uh, do my best to sneak my jingly little self into the tent um, and uh, try to um, investigate the bars. Indeed, indeed. I think this is probably a risk roll. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the risk roll. So 
you stated what you want to accomplish, which is you want to get inside the hut, presumably unseen, and see what's in the box. What's in the box? And so it's not that, right? Um, and so that's straightforward. The next thing is the three of us as players get to say what we think could happen if you fail. Like if this goes poorly, what, what could happen? And so I'll ask you out of character, Michael and Daniel, what do you think could happen? Could we say whatever's in the box is, or are we not to that part yet? You can do it, it's fine, yeah. Okay, I would say whatever's in the box is like Arctic Covenant, like would just fry his noodle, if that were the case. <laughs> Wait, so like there's something like dangerous about it? Like it would burn Not you Not like... dangerous per se, but like something that he just might not be able to comprehend. Oh, like like Lovecraftian, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. madness cut it. Okay, good. Oh, well, I'm super into that. I think um, I'll keep it fairly straightforward. I think that basically someone sees you go in and uh, maybe they shank you from behind or something, right? Who knows? Um, Daniel, any thoughts? What could go wrong? Yes, uh, because you you mentioned your your failing sight. No matter what, uh, you you somehow take a wrong turn when you're leaving the house and you get lost in the village. Oh, that could be fun. Okay, so we have some ideas. I can do whatever I want, but I just you know we just kind of do a little brainstorming. Now let's talk about dice. So you get one light die if you have a relevant um, skill. Or if you're somehow using the environment in a in a in a in a beneficial way. So what do you think? Perhaps obfuscation would would count. Although I don't know if that's more like um, in seeing through something that's obscure, or if that's creating obscurity. I think you go both ways, right? So um, I'll take it. You have one light die, okay. and you get a second light die if you accept a devil's bargain from one of us. Now here again. The three of us as players, we can each make an offer. This is a thing that happens no matter what. And if you accept it, you get a second light die. And so I'm going to steal Michael's because that's what I do. And I'm gonna steal Michael's fail condition and say, no matter what, there is something of like mind bending power inside the box. Michael and Daniel get to make an offer as well. Um, I would say no matter what, um, a child from the village um, is perhaps at the window, curious child of the village is at the window and would see. So maybe not an adult would see, but but absolutely somebody of interest. Yeah. I still like I still like playing as last night. No matter what, you you somehow become disoriented in the house. Or maybe the house looks on the inside is different than it looks on the outside, and you 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 get lost in the house somehow. Yeah, it's intriguing. You have three good options here. What do you think, um, Ryan? And can I take any or any or none of them? You can you can take none or one. One, That's okay. Um, if you take none, you'll get a die. If you take right. one, you get the die. I mean, how can I turn down the option to have some sort of Cthulhu uh, <laughs> mind blowing? Uh, thing inside of there. So you have what two light I dice. Okay. You have two light dice. Uh, I'm not going to make you roll dark die. Yes, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to make you put a dark die in yet. Normally, if you were risking your mind or body, you'd put a dark die in. But you don't know you are risking your mind or body yet, and so for the time being, it's just two light dice. However, if you don't like the result of your roll, you might be able to add a dark die to try again to get a better sure. result. So go ahead and roll uh, on the roller. You can just do forward slash risk uh, two. Okay, you have a five light. So a five means you succeed. You will fundamentally get in there and be able to open the box. But there's a complication. And the complication is whatever is in the box is going to change you in some way that you're going to have to deal with for the rest of the incursion. <laughs> so if you're okay with that, you let it ride. Otherwise, you can add a dark die and try again. I think that's great. Let's do it. Yeah. Fabulous. 
So let's come back. We'll come back to this moment in a minute. I'll let you narrate it in a moment. I'm going to get back to the ritual. I'd like to just have a scene with Milo and Hiltrude because you both are sort of aware of kind of what might be going on here. And there's a little bit of downtime or, you know, while other people do their offerings or whatever. So let's just have a scene with the two of you, you know, maybe there by the, by the ale stand or something. Hiltrude. Yeah. I swore, I swear that as the elder took my, took, took my offering that I heard something on, in or behind the effigy. Your mind is not betraying you. I, I heard something similar. I'm, I'm concerned that perhaps their old way of uh, this ritual perhaps has returned. I warned as we approached the village, I warned you that these small villages, uh, they may be slipping back. And uh, this is this is not good. What do we do? I mean, we have we have a goal to accomplish. We can't go around sticking our noses and bringing attention. Until we get to the island, we should not uh, we should not let each other uh, leave our sights. We should keep an eye on each other because who? I mean, I don't know the rest of the story. I mean, does does the uh, does the queen of the tides need a need a uh, you know a prince? You're worried about maybe next. Milo, you hear a voice from, there's like a little hut nearby, and up on the roof of the hut, you hear a voice, a child perhaps on the roof, that says, the voice says, you're all going to die tonight. What do you do, Milo? I say, see, see. You both look up. There's just a seagull up there. Hilcher just crowing like seagulls do. But Milo, the seagull is looking you right in the eye and it's just saying, dead, 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 dead. Maybe this salt air is getting to you, friend. Can you not hear it? I hear nothing but the caw of a gull. Like a like a creepy like a creepy gull though, right? Yeah, cr creepy gull. I pat him on the back. Dead. So uh, about keeping an eye on each other. Uh, where's for it, Milo? You have a condition. Your condition, you can note it on your page. The seagulls are mocking you. Even even the seagulls mock me. <laughs> we'll come back to the scene in a moment. For it. Do please describe the scene of you infiltrating the hut. What's, what happens here? Give us all your skills. Um, um, maybe... Uh... Yeah, when I turn my cloak inside out, it's sort of camouflaged a little. Um, and I can identify a moment when it's best for me to slip in and um, slip the, the door handle open and uh, get inside. I look around and um, I don't see the box sitting out anywhere, but um, with some rummaging around, maybe they've hit it under... Um, um, Maybe like under like a like a with a cloth over it or something, just to um, make make it so nobody that's looking in the window may would see it. Um, and I slowly pull the the cloth off and notice the box. Is it just a simple box like with? Um, it's like a like a like a iron lock box, like a yeah like a locked box, but it's not locked. It's I see. Just closed. Um, and I, I run. Yeah, I uh, run my fingers over the over the edge of it to. Um, sort of just test it out, I guess, and before I begin to creep it open slowly. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Hiltrude, 
you will notice that the very last person in line to make their offering is that woman who you were talking to earlier, the grieving woman. And everyone is giving her lots of space, a very wide berth, as she slowly approaches the effigy. And you can see her shadow in the torchlight getting smaller and smaller as she slumps down lower and lower. And she can't make it the whole way. She collapses on her hands and knees before she reaches the end. And she's just crying, just sobbing uncontrollably. And the elders and all the people in the village are just watching. They're not going to her. They're not trying to help her up or anything. They're just watching with a solemnity. Mm -hmm. What do you do, Hildred? I mean, I, I have to do what I have to do as a, uh, as a, as a medium and empath. I, um, I immediately rush to her. Um, and One uh, of the elders says, no, she must make this journey herself. But can't you see she's she's hurting? I don't understand. I I'm, I don't understand your ways. Her tears are like salt water being returned to the queen of tides. The grief is joyous to her, to she below the waves. This I... is a celebration. And the woman is just like, I mean, she's just like, she she just is just laying there bawling. She can't like, you know, her cries are getting louder and louder. I I shake my head uh slightly and I, I step a few feet back and I I watch. Make another ruin um, roll. <sighs> Your result was four. What's your current ruin? Uh, my current ruin is also four. So it doesn't go up. So you're okay. you're good as far as that goes. I do want to know how it makes you feel, though. I feel horrible. Um, my inside's hollow like, like hunger, um, like hunger pain or on the on the verge of of of, of vomiting. I I um I can't help but but share her despair. Yeah. Here, I'm going to give you your condition. Oh, I should clarify your condition as well, uh, Milo. It's not just that the seabirds are mocking you. You can understand them. You can understand their speech. They just happen to be mocking you. <laughs> But you know, if you like wanted to talk to one or something, I suppose you could. Right? You will notice here, as you, Hiltrude, as you sort of step back, you feel a scratch around your tear ducts, actually. And you can feel a hardness around your tear ducts, a growth of some sort. What do you do? I, I touch it to feel if there's anything physically there. There is. It feels like a barnacle forming around your eye. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what that feels like, having never really been to the sea. Um, and so I, I turn to Milo and I say, do I, do I have something on my face? Milo, indeed, you do see Hildrude has barnacles, like small barnacle formations on her eyes, around her eyes. That's going to leave a mark. We gotta, that's um, that's got to be scraped off, I think. I'm not a boat. I'm not uh, a boat. Then we won't keelhaul you, so. 
the elder says, my dear woman, he approaches you, he extends his hand and gently cups your face and strokes that spot. You'd feel it, his soft fingertips, if not for the fact that he's stroking the barnacle. And he says, you have been blessed by the queen of tides. Your grief, your empathy has reached out to her and she has given you her mark. What a joyous day. Good. Blessed. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I, I kind of pull my, my collar and my hood up a little bit to, to kind of just act like I'm staying warm, but I'm, I'm trying to hide it as best I can. Do not be ashamed of the gift of the sea. And you'll notice here, the woman has finally gotten up and she has made the rest of the journey to the effigy. For it, I haven't forgotten about you. I think it would be cheap, or I think it would cheapen it to say what you see in the box. I don't want to say what you see in the box. I do, however, want to know what it's like to experience what you feel after having looked in the box. And playing a little bit off of what Daniel suggested with Daniel's offerings during the role, I think that you have the sensation of being underwater in a labyrinth beneath the ocean, lost. You manage to find your way out, but only by making a grave sacrifice in this daydream or whatever it is, night dream, I guess. What, 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 do you, what do you sacrifice in order to reach the end? That's a good question. Um... Um, I think that Ferret decides to sacrifice, um, maybe any doubt that they have in their cause. Um, maybe that's, maybe there's a, a, a thread, um, that maybe <clears throat> they rely on, uh, the doubt that, um, grounds them and maybe uh, keeps them from so a sense of self-preservation to keep oh. them from going too far. Oh, very good. I like that. That's quite good. Uh, make a ruin roll for now. We're going to memorialize this with a ruin roll. Just see how that goes. Uh, you're good. You got a one. So your ruin doesn't go up. But you have made this sacrifice and I did promise you a change. And I think that is your change. Your change is, is you don't have that you have this it's it's confidence i guess so over well over overweening confidence it sounds like and that's very interesting to me tell me for it how do you feel about making the offering now with your new renewed perspective um yeah, for it, uh, maybe even leaves behind what's in the the the, uh, the 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 box and steps out and looks to see if um there's this the if they're the I guess the acolytes whoever were still accepting offers and uh, heads that direction. You do, and the elder comes out to greet you. And he says, oh, my child, you have gazed 
upon the realm of the Queen of Tides. I can see it in your face. You have a glow about you. Have you perhaps reconsidered your position? Do you wish to make an offering to the Queen? Uh, I have, I think I've, um, I've come to, to, uh, to see the, the merit of this, of, of what I can offer. Um, there is but one offering we need or require of you, dear heart. Please come. And he beckons you, and I'm sure you follow. And you're walking up to the effigy, this woven driftwood thing. And he says, give me your hand. Do you? I do. Yeah. He takes a knife that is encrusted with seashells and blasted sand. He slices open your finger deep and long. The blood is dribbling out. And he says, put your hand inside. And he beckons you to put your hand inside the tangle of driftwood. Do you do it? Yeah, I do. You feel at first, a gentle, gentle suckling, like a kitten. And it's mother's teeth, sort of. And then a little bit more frenzied, chewing biting down hard on the knuckle. And finally you withdraw. And the elder says, now she has the strength to make the journey into the watery realm. Make another ruin roll, please. holding it together. How are you actually, despite what you as a player may feel, how are, how are you as, as for it? How are you feeling almost emboldened or made comfort, or given mm -hmm. comfort by this action? I think Forrest has started to conflate maybe like who they're doing what for, but um, has maybe a uh, um, comfort in like, feeling like they have actually served in a in a like a physical concrete way and someone will take a seaweed binding and bind up your finger and it's like you're part of the family everyone's very very happy that you've made this sacrifice right yeah. even the mother the grieving mother comes up to you and she holds you, she embraces you. And I think with that, so passes ring one. Let's take a five minute break. We'll come back, continue. Ring two. The tide comes in bearing the ocean's bounty. The evening is pretty much a blur from this point on. You perhaps continue drinking, continue eating, continue celebrating. For it, you're very, very like part of the community, especially, but all three of you are welcomed quite heartily because you all gave offerings. And 
as this evening wears on, you hear in the distance, echoing from the water in the salty air, sea shanties, joyous, but sometimes bearing tragic tales and dire warnings. But no, happy, happy songs. At one point, a fog rolls in and the celebration ceases for just a moment as everyone sort of becomes quite silent. They believe it is the Queen of Tides responding to the moment, sending in the fog. But the fog rolls away eventually. And the celebrations resume. At one point, Milo, you notice a strange thing for a night. A fish-filled pelican lands on a little rocky outcropping near the shore. And it calls out, Milo, it says, my belly is full with the catch, and now I must rest. Now I must let the fullness of my belly settle so that I may begin the catch anew. But of course, everyone else just hears the calling of this pelican. At one point, Milo, that same pelican, something gets its attention in the water and it says, my, my, what does my sharp avian eye spy down below the waves? Milo, you can see something large in the water, in the shadowy, a large shadowy figure in the moonlight just beneath the surface something perhaps that is going to grab this pelican. What do you do? Warning. That's, uh, that's, that's, your eyes are larger than your stomach. That's, uh, that's, that's too big. You need to- A shark, a shark jumps out, snatches the pelican up, goes back down into the water. And the festivities roil and spin careening and the whole time the effigy looming overall and dawn breaks the golden pinkish light of dawn and now they're ready for the procession you are all invited you're given a boat festooned with flowers, painted with pictures on the side. And everyone takes their little boat. The effigy is sort of suspended between two boats as it's brought out to sea. I assume you all get the boats because their destination is that island. That's where you want to be. And so, The procession of fishing boats is heading to the island to complete the ceremony. Everyone's seafoam green vestments seem somehow even more dazzling in the dawn light. And yet, the sky begins to gray. Milo, you hear a little voice behind you on the boat. It says, a storm is coming.
Thank you, Captain Obvious. Um, and I, I turn over and, and I guess it's, I'm thinking it's a bird. It is. Uh, those clouds look pretty ominous, little fella. For it, Hiltrude, have you previously seen Milo talking to the birds? It's a new development. Let's just have the scene in your little boat. Role play. Um, friend, are you? Is it still the gulls? I don't, this is just some kind of piper. I don't, some kind of little sandpiper. I look around him uh, to the back of the boat. I'm assuming I see its head cocking around. Um, Milo, I, uh, I'm not hearing anything other than the, the squawking and cawing of the bird. Are you, but, uh, are you feeling okay? Well, I mean, the bird and I agree on the storm that's coming. Um, clearly, you can see the the clouds as they as they darken, but uh, I didn't get I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Yes. I um, I kind of lean around Milo towards the bird, and um, kind of try to see if I can sense anything strange about the bird. Um, maybe spiritual. Maybe something's tethered to it. I say, friend, I, okay. Storm Allow me to demonstrate. Allow me to demonstrate. Uh, turn to the bird. Um, tell, tell, bird, explain uh, your, your weather forecast to my companions. Your boats are going to be dashed upon the rocks as the fury of the queen of tides pulls you down into her realm. She is displeased. She is displeased. I indicate to, to the bird uh, is very pessimistic this morning. Um, how should you, are you getting anything from that? I, I take a piece of, uh, uh, I take a piece of uh, uh, bread that I had um, uh, stashed away um, from previously, pretended to eat, but had not. And I hand it to Milo and I say, uh, here, friend, perhaps this will make your stomach full and your mind calm. I thought it was for the bird. And I, I, uh, too. I, I, I I'm giving it, oh, and I, I shall, thank you. Um, mm. A fine last meal. I will split it. I will split it with you. I turn back to the front of the boat. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Ford's probably a little annoyed with the bird and maybe like tries to shoot it off a little bit. Yeah, for the bird will, will fly away. It's no, no big deal. But as it flies away, it's just it's like flying overhead. It's the storm is coming. The storm is coming. Storm's coming. We got it, bird. But um luckily i'm a sailor indeed it is also may i say overhead. may i say i love that i i talk to spirits and yet talking to birds is considered uh weird <laughs> <laughs> it is quite gray overhead though uh it, it the sky is filled with portent you know eventually the boats, it's a long procession of boats and you're way in the back. And the boats near the front, the ones with the effigy, they reach the, they reach the, the island and all the other boats just sort of like spread out, they fan out in the water as the two boats with the effigy um, they begin to lift the effigy. You all can take your place among the array of boats as everybody spreads out. Do you remain near the back or do you go for a front row seat? I, I think uh, I would be, if, if, I, if I'm assuming that I'm steering the boat, uh, I think I'm, I would, I think we should get to the to an edge to make like this is the island we're going for, right? With the secret cove, it is, yeah. But we should at least be on the like a on, on the periphery. I don't know what, what you guys think. But... Well, and here I will remind you of the old fisherman as well, who was going to show you where the secret cove is. Do we? 
Do we see him? Yeah, he's in another boat, but he's like up close to the effigy. We'll go back. We'll we'll try to. I'll try to stay towards him then. Yeah, you can maneuver to be up a little closer to where the actual ceremony is taking place. The elder stands up and he says, Oh, queen of tides, we make this offering to you on this most sacred green tide. We pray that it will be well remarked that you will bless us with a bountiful catch, with gentle waves, with soft and susurrating sea airs. And they are tipping the effigy and ready to drop it into the ocean. You will all see there is a woman in the effigy. You see her look of terror, her eyes wide as the dawning realization of what's about to happen is about to happen. And they are getting ready to tip and drop her in. What do the three of you do, if anything? Do do rituals require, um, like verbal, like like verbal components and outwardly you, you motions, or is it just something I could like do in my robe and be? Yeah. You can describe it however you wish. It's fine. Okay, I will uh, ask you what it looks like. But gotcha. Uh, Hiltrude, um eyes roll slightly back in her head as she reaches out to the nearest, hopefully benevolent spirit um, and requests that they do what they can to prevent this um, to interject. So you're doing haunt, I guess. Yes. Haunt. I'm, I'm They are. They are. They are to haunt this boat about to push the effigy over. I love it. This is a risk roll, obviously. Okay. Um, so your sounds like your goal is to stop the effigy being dipped in the water, right? Or, or dipped into the water. Okay, good. I like that. And so let's talk about what could go wrong. Daniel, Ryan, any thoughts? She's the she still dies. Yeah, like, I, I think it's like it's like she still dies. It's even more horrible. Like, <laughs> right. So it's just a complete like. 180 bad result um what i'm thinking is that not she, maybe she didn't fall into the water but if the villagers see that she's not going in then they they finish her off is what i'm thinking yeah that's interesting so uh ryan do you have any thoughts maybe um um something like whatever is hungering for like the sacrifice pulls more than the effigy and the woman into the water oh well, that's good i think yeah, I kind of like a combination of those things. So we'll kind of see where it goes. Okay, let's talk about dice. So if you have a skill, or if you are somehow using the environment to your advantage, you get a light die, heal tree. Um, I have spirits. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't get any more straightforward than that. Uh, let's talk about Devil's Bargain. It's Devil's Bargain, I'll remind you, something that happens no matter what, whether this succeeds or fails. Who, this is a, there's some great potential for devil bar Devil's Bargains in this scene, I feel like. So um, yeah, whoever wants to. I'm gonna think about mine. Don't worry, but if anybody has an idea, dive in. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with uh, with with uh, with Ryan's where uh, you save uh, you save the girl, but something tentacles something takes other people off the boat. As, oh, so as, no matter what, something attacks from right. Save so, save yeah. the girl, but some the the people on the boat get. Well, it could fail too. You might not save the girl, and like it, this, the devil's bargain happens regardless whether. Okay, so yeah, more people die. Yeah, more people get swallowed up instead of just her. My offer is going to be, I'm going to try to tie it to your drive somehow, which is this. I'm going to say that, well, here I think we have to know, this is kind of an out of character thing, but I want to know like, what is the king's true nature that you're like determined to <laughs> like to have revealed? <laughs> 
Um, the king's true nature is that he he is manipulating his 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 people, his court, his constituents with um, with cultist magic. Oh, I see. Um, to to um, to basically keep the crown um, to prevent upheavals oh, um, and things okay. like that. That's intriguing. I'm gonna say that. Yeah, let me think on it. Go ahead, Ryan. Skip. Um, I, I don't know, um, how conditions would work, but my thought was maybe, um, your breath is, uh, given to the woman and maybe you, um, momentary, like choke on salt water or something for a moment, but I don't know what that would, if that's a, uh, it yeah, sounds sure. a little bit more like a fail condition, if I'm being yeah, honest, right. but yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we might be able to play with it if if that's if Michael's interested in it, we can make it work. Um, I'm going to say that no matter what, you discover a member of the king's secret cult here among the revelers. That's my offer. Okay. Can I? You said like we could choose one, or I can do my own. You can choose one or do none. It's it's one or none. Yeah. Oh darn! Because I was gonna say I I wanted to combine two of those. Yeah, you have to pick one. Um, darn. Um, record. I like the idea. I like the idea that something, even though I I would love to forward the story more, uh, as as my personal story, I love the idea that the the ocean just won't give her up, and so that something would come up. Either way, something's gonna come up and take. Most of those, perhaps even the person that's supposed to lead us to that portion of the cave. Yeah, I love it. It's great. Um, I'm curious what your combined idea was, though. My combined idea was for that and for the cultist to notice. <laughs> oh, for the cult. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe the cultist did it, possibly, right? Oh, yeah. maybe. <laughs> maybe it's still the case. I don't know. I'll think on it. Um, as long as we satisfy the devil's bargain, we can add any of the details we want, right? Sure. Um, love all that. Okay, good. You got two light dice. Dark die you have to do because of the ritual. So roll risk two, one, and we'll see how this goes. Okay. Darn. I'm not, hold on, I'm still looking. Well, I mean, six dark, full success. So that's good. Um, your ruin does go up, but you. Uh, 100% save, um, save her. She's saved no matter what. But I'll I'll handle the creature from the depths. <laughs> That'll be my thing. Um, but describe your ritual. What does it look like? Um, so as I said before, her eyes kind of roll back into her head a little bit. Um, she she brings her hands into her robe. She's she is kind of as the picture states, she's kind of wearing armor, but she also has kind of like a robe over top of it, like a traveling cloak. And um, her hands are kind of moving um, under her robe and she, her eyes are in the back of her head. And um, the the spirit um, in this situation, I, I would have to assume that the spirit in this situation, while not visible, has a has a has some sort of physical force, some sort of 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 moving this grabbing that pushing here so maybe it doesn't and maybe it's not verbal or visual but it's absolutely halting things as they stand and i think it like i'd like to suggest that it just like pushes her ashore right mm. so that she's away from the danger of being dropped in like the effigy is just like pushed up onto the sand almost like a beached vessel right yeah it grabs her like a like a board and just moves her right up uh, right up on the shore yeah and there's a cacophony of like what the hell's going on for everybody there right there's a lot of like there's a lot of like has the queen of tides rejected the offering like they're all like what like do, do something do something and there's a lot of like you know just chaos kind of breaking out and accusations start flying between the little boats of people suggesting that other people are not as pious as they need to be in order for the offering to be accepted. Never, never in hundreds of years has, has the offering ended up like touched the sand of the, of the sacred island, right? Like all this stuff is going on, right? 
I am curious just to check in with Milo and Forrett. Like, what are you two doing during all this, just out of curiosity? Um, I am, uh, uh, when they start saying like, uh, who, who did this and, and, and I'm, and if I suspect that it was Hiltrude and I know that as outsiders, they're going to, they're going to turn their eyes on us. So maybe, maybe I start rowing a, a, a little way or start getting us a little bit away from the, the scene, but try not to be too obvious. I might be able to, I, I might be able to pull that off with a roll. I think so. Maybe, um, I, I'm going to check with for it for it. What are you thinking? What are you doing? Um, I <clears throat> assume Hiltrude and Milo and I have uh, traveled together long enough for us to know that we're able to do like our rituals, right? So I would maybe recognize this and uh, know that it was Hiltrude and immediately like maybe grab you by the cloak and demand to know what, what you've done, like why you've done this, like you've destroyed the offering. Why, like how could you do, like why would you do this? Yeah, take it away. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the pain. Can you not feel the pain? The pain from her. The pain from her friends. I. It's it's unbearable. And what about the pain from the the Queen of Tides? Her hunger pains. I. I don't know about any of that. I'm. The ocean's not really my thing. You should see what they do in villages. You should see what they do in villages that are impoverished. Like this is nothing. This was like, uh, like she probably volunteered. And I'm, get this, Milo. <laughs> While they're having the argument, Milo, you will notice. So, Milo, there are two other people in the procession who are not wearing the sea foam green robes, apart from the three of you. The fisherman, who is nearby and another outsider. The outsider is wearing robes of deep blue silk with gold trim. And they have their own boat all by themselves. And Milo, as you are sort of yelling at them and trying to steer the boat and everything, you know, kind of paddle the boat to away from the group, you will notice that man or woman, perhaps in the silk robes, you will notice them, their heads down, and you'll just hear, and what do you do, Milo? Row faster. A tentacle oily and black, shoots up out of the water, wraps around the fisherman's throat. He has a wild look in his eyes and he gasps out, I have been chosen by the queen. And his esophagus is crushed in short order and he is yanked down below the depths. Panic is setting in. You have to escape, Milo, as these tentacles are bursting up, grabbing people, pulling them down, crushing their boats, something terrible, not touching that little boat with the person in the robes at all. They are like in the eye of the storm, perfectly calm, chanting their words. Milo, what do you do? Head to the island. This is a risk roll to get through this safely. Michael, Ryan, what could go wrong? We obviously could be <clears throat> knocked out of the boat um, and have to swim. Um, be a simple consequence. Seems reasonable to me. It's probably what I would go with too. Michael, any additional thoughts? Um, I would say that perhaps as he's as he's so vigorously trying to row the boat, um, he breaks a portion of said boat, um, perhaps the one of the oar holders or something to that extent, and leaves us stranded um, on the boat and very obvious. Yeah, I like that too. Mm, okay, so we have some thoughts here. 
Let's talk about your skills. Milo, you have, uh, I don't know if your skill, are any of your skills applicable? What do you think? Maybe, maybe, maybe dexterity. Um, maybe it's like as, I don't know, it feels more like a strength thing to me than a nimbleness thing, but I could be wrong. Um, spontaneity, possibly. What about the environment might you be using to like get to the shore safely? The environment's another way to get your I think uh, we could, uh, we could, instead of using the oars to row, I could use the oars to push off some of the other boats. Oh, good. I like that. Oh, yeah. that's, you're using the other boat's momentum. Oh, that's good. Yeah, okay. I'll take that. You have one light die. And you get a second light die for a devil's bargain. Oh, boy. Uh, my devil's bargain is going to be no matter what, the cultist also makes it to the island. Mine is uh, no matter what. Um, I don't. I don't know if it's already going this way. I don't. I don't. I don't remember if you said he was already pulled in, but the the fisherman, the guide, is taken. Oh yeah, he's gone. Oh, he's already gone. Yeah. Okay. Unless um, I might go for it, a chance to rescue him, but we'll see. Okay. Then I would say, um, no matter what, um, when we get there, there was there is already some sort of liaisons from the village. Uh, that that um was was set to prepare the location or something like that interesting um my thought maybe the uh the queen of the sea develops a grudge against milo <laughs> oh yeah three very interesting offers what do you think daniel that's my livelihood man i'm gonna go with the cultist that's what i'm gonna go with you have two light dice and I think a dark die is required here because of the, um, the nature of what you're doing. This could also be a good chance for a help roll. A help roll is a special roll that uh, basically one of your companions or both can essentially, after, they can choose to do it after you roll, uh, but basically as long as your roll includes a dark die, they can roll a light die and it gets included as part of the roll. But if the light die matches the dark die, the roof goes up. So perhaps a dangerous move for you right now, Hiltrude. <laughs> but uh, but I but for it has some space for it. So yeah. Um, um, I may depending on how the yeah, roll goes. Let's see how it goes. Risk two one, take it away. Is this your result right here? Five five five? That's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um the complication is going to be quite simple. Uh your boat is irreparably busted. You don't have any immediate way back to the, off the island. Um, if you're okay with that, we can just plow forward. Otherwise, uh, for it, you can try the help if you wish to get a six. It's up to you. Um, I think let's do it. Let's figure. Let's try. Just roll uh, forward slash weak on the die roller. You just have to say how you're exposing yourself to danger right now. I see. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure exactly how big the boat is, but put myself in a more precarious position. Maybe I'm standing up mm. or um, more on the edge to maybe look out or try to guide a little bit. That's great. Uh, we got six, so that's great. So yeah, it's a six light, that's your, so no complication. You have your boat intact and everything. Milo, take it away, give us the scene. I shove off. Uh, I shove off from the other um, from the other other boat and catch a wave, almost like we're almost like uh, we're we're pulling close enough to the island where we're we're getting some wave action, and um, for it is pointing out uh, rocks as we as we approach, and I I can see as I look back at the at the at the chaos, I can see that the the cultist that his boat or his he, her, he or she's boat, um, they're. Uh, um, with their robes, I can see that the boat is is maybe the last one standing. If not, uh, it's still kind of headed this way as we maneuver through the through the rocks and and hit the hit the sand. Yeah, that's great. I love it. I, I think I still pick up a ruin though. Uh, 
you do not because the new result is a six light. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks for that for it. Good, good spotting. Of course I, um, yeah, she's, they're, they're not, they don't want to die here. <laughs> Hiltrude, as you're all pulling yourselves up on the sand, pulling the boat up on the beach, I think the cultist is on another part of the island there, but not nearby for our purposes. You are fairly close to the effigy though. But as you're pulling up, you realize that the barnacles have started to spread down your cheek and down your neck. And you only notice it initially, after the chaos of this moment especially, because you hear a little rattling, a little something rattling around in the vicinity of your neck. And you see a little sea centipede, or you feel a little sea centipede crawling out of the barnacle on your neck, crawling up and trying to part your lips and enter your mouth. What do you do? Um, I immediately, I immediately tear it, tear at the centipede, and and kind of pull at the barnacles that have spread. Um, and I look at Milo with like a, with a desperation and I say, um, what, what exactly is entailed in, in scraping these off? They normally, uh, apply to wood. So, oh, I've oh. not, I've not actually, I've seen a lot, but I've not actually seen, I've seen this particular ailment unless it's a wood. I tug a little harder out of desperation and then I, I just kind of give up. I mean, we can try to scrape it off, but I think at this point we should also talk about five ruin, because once you have five ruin, you can now you are now eligible to do what's called a reduction roll. A reduction roll means that you betray the group secretly in order to you're essentially doing the bidding of the tide queen, right? You betray the group in some way, and then you get to lower your ruin. There's a chance that the others catch your betrayal, but maybe not. But it is a surefire way to get your ruin lowered. Uh, I will remind you, if your ruin goes up one more time, Hiltrude, your character's out. So as everyone is sort of like coming ashore, kind of like accounting for all their things, you know, you know, coughing up seawater, I will tell you that you notice that the remainder of the procession, whoever survived, is headed back to the village and you just see lots of driftwood or lots of wood floating. We'll talk about the guide in a moment. I'm not done with him yet, but I do want to know that while everyone's sort of distracted Hiltrude, this might be an opportunity to do this, to betray the group in some way, but it's up to you. Yeah, if, if I could, if I could um, set our boat adrift, which honestly, I mean, the cultists would have a boat too, so it's, it's not entirely screwing us over, um but you, don't, but you um, don't know that though right i don't know that so that yeah maybe that is a little better but um well, but no but it's yeah. okay though because it means like your character doesn't know that though right so they could yeah 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 they still absolutely they're doing it yeah. absolutely because we don't even know that the cultist is here yet so um yeah my character um uh hiltrude will will um kind of lightly push um as she's the the kind of the closest to the to the boat um as, as everybody's kind of dragging themselves off and such, she'll kind of slightly, uh, lightly kick uh, the boat um, just enough to kind of push it back off the sand into the water. I love it. So here's how, um, here's how this works. I go ahead and roll forward slash reduction to see how you do. I think that's a command. We're about to find out. <laughs> it yeah. is indeed. Uh, the, the commands are wrong. Uh, this is the old version of the reduction role. You're, in fact, you're, you're, uh, your ruin goes down no matter what. The difference is because you got lower than your current ruin, the others don't notice. So oh. um, you managed to surreptitiously 
uh, get rid of the ride back home. <laughs> I'm curious, because your ruin's going down, how does this make you feel better or feel more in control? Um, I feel like after what happened on the water, Hiltrude would be feel very out of control, um, not realizing that maybe her past is catching up with her. And so um, this is kind of harkening back to her, her, her deep set cultist days where she just does whatever she can to survive. It's, it's <clears throat> without going too into depth, it's, it's, it's how she escaped to begin with. And it comforts her in a little way. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Lori, you ruined a four. And you can keep doing this. Once you start, uh, you don't have to stop. <laughs> so... Right. Oh, I noticed you're still on five. It's four now. All right. Yeah, you can keep lowering your ruin. So in this way, by betraying the group. Part so, of the uh, honestly, part of the reason I took haunt. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, like whoops. <laughs> so let's talk about what's going on right now. All right. So you're all ashore. The storm. There is a storm. Incidentally, like that actually was true. There is a storm gathering over the island. It's probably going to be a bad one because the Queen of Tides did not, in fact, get her offering, right? So this could be uh, pretty bad if you believe in such things anyway. You know, for it, we've established that you always have your eye out for the treasure, right? And you'll notice that on the rocky, you will have noticed on the rocky slopes, there are quite a few coins, some fragments of ornate pottery, maybe some waterlogged books, evidence of recent shipwrecks perhaps, treasures maybe waiting to be claimed nearby. In fact, you'll see a shattered rowboat a little way down the shore. What do you do? Um. I think you're wasting no time starting to um, collect as many things as I can. Um, each coin I pick up, I, I do a quick inspection of the stamping and, and what. I would also like, at this point, I would like for everyone to make a ruin roll because of what you all just experienced, as it all takes a minute to settle in, right? Everyone just give me a ruin. Looks like everyone but Milo is going up. Oh, Hiltrude. Good thing you did your betrayal, though, right? <laughs> for it, you're going up to four, yes. You'll be out of condition, which we'll talk about in a bit. How are you feeling right now? Um. Uh, me in particular? Uh, that was for Fort, actually. I do want to know. Oh, I apologize. Oh, that's okay. But I'm curious, Fort, how do you feel? Um, um, a little bit um, in awe of what we saw and uh, sort of immediate power the, and, that um, we saw exhibited by the Queen of the Tides and um, maybe some exhilaration, but also, uh, yeah, definitely a, a little afraid as well. Yeah, that's great. Let me take a look at our conditions here. Hmm. Um, so I'm sorry, let me pick up again. So what do you do once you see that sort of like cracked sailboat? There does seem to be like a trail of detritus, valuable, quasi-valuable detritus coming from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think starting to pick up the coins one by one, looking at them and, and pocketing them. Um, uh, maybe. Uh, less interested in the in the pots or broken things but um certainly you know i i am drawn to the things i think i can sell and um as interesting as a broken pot maybe it doesn't uh, fetch much on the on the road so um start with those but then definitely see if i can look around in the below the seats and whatnot in the rowboat um to see what what may have been 
uh, stowed away and, and left behind to order. Um, yeah, just try to. Yeah, you're gathering these coins. In. Gathering these coins feels like a bit of a score, all things considered. Going up to the boat, trying to like overturn it, see what you can find. I'm curious for it. What luxuries will you spend your gold on when the journey is over? If you make it back. A nice pair of shoes, um, like walking boots, um, a comfortable night at an inn, um, maybe some candles and, uh, and quills and paper uh, ink. Um, Maybe uh, a lockbox at a bank or something like that, or, or somewhere to stow away some things. As you're reaching around in this cracked hull of the overturned boat, you'll start to feel a little skittering around your hands, and in particular around that finger. you will notice that a little collection of crabs is, I would say delicately, gently, trying to peel away the seaweed bindings around your finger. Almost respectfully, what do you do? Um, I think I, uh... Maybe we'll sit down or so, so I can hold my hand more comfortably in a comfortable position uh, and um, make sure I'm not sitting on any crabs or um, any, any way that's some safe, you know, um, and just kind of see where it goes. Um, uh, not necessarily um, like happy about this, but I'm, uh, you know, interested enough to let it happen. Yeah, I like it. Um, we'll come back to that moment. Hiltrude, you hear from the effigy moaning. What do you do? Um, I, I will, um, I, I'll rush over to the effigy and, um, as I inspect it, how is she in the effigy? Like, how is she? Is is she like sewn in with with vines, or is she? Yeah, like like the willow was, or the the driftwood was built up around her like a cage, basically. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I I take out um a a a dagger which I typically use for um for like I use on ceremony. Um, and, uh, it's, it's kind of bejeweled ornate, um, way too nice to be cutting through driftwood. And, um, and I just start, I just start tearing around, um, the, any bindings that I can find that won't, won't harm her. You can free her and she sort of, when she's able to, she reaches out and she, she grabs you, she embraces you like tightly. Um, it seems as if perhaps she was in some sort of fugue state right before they were ready to tip her into the ocean, right? And whatever was happening to her last night, she's snapped out of it completely by now. And she says, thank you, thank you. I, I fear, I fear, however, that I have condemned you all to death. I, uh... Uh, holding her, holding her close and rubbing her back as to kind of warm her up a little bit. Um, I take out another piece of bread out of my robes and hand it to her and say, oh, don't worry, we've, we've all condemned ourselves to death, dear. No, but you don't understand. She chops the bread. I was meant, I was meant to go to her watery realm and, and look what happened. A price was paid. She looks at, you see the wreckage of all the, you know, <laughs> the boats that were attacked. She's like, how swift and terrible her anger. And she will fulfill that rage to completion upon all of you. 
until I am returned to the water. Um, I saw the cultists do what the cultists did, correct? You did not. Only my I saw that. Didn't. Okay. Yeah. Um, then I will. I want to check with Milo for a moment. Milo, what are okay. you doing right now? Um, I think I, I was interested in the in the effigy in the in the woman, but I think at this point I probably see our our small boat like drifting, drifting out to the drifting ocean. Out. Yeah. So I'm I'm probably running uh, to try to retrieve it up to and maybe only up to my, I was about to say my waist up to my knees in the water, and then uh, um, and then just try to look on the beach and survey, and I see. I, I, I see Hiltrude with the with the the woman in effigy, and I see Forrest sitting by, uh, I guess, a, near a, a wrecked ship or yeah, a, wrecked a little ways boat. down the beach. But yeah, yeah. So I, I'm I think I'm going to head towards uh, Forrest. I like that actually. I think we're going to experience what Forrest experiences through you, Milo. You see. you come upon what almost feels like a reverent moment. Like as you approach Milo, even though there's a storm gathering, even though the sky is gray, even though the air is filled with nothing but gloom and dread, there is around this boat, around for it, a nimbus of the divine. How do you experience that? What do you, how does it feel? I think uh, I've always respected the ocean, but I've never like worshiped the ocean. And uh, and I'm seeing the connection between, um, which I'm starting to think that maybe that this queen of the endless tides is not um, like a local deity spirit, but I'm starting to think maybe this is a, a much larger um, and so I think I would take a step back because I'm I'm seeing the um, I'm seeing the ocean as not uh, a place of work, but as a, maybe an entity. For it, I'm giving you a condition called the Cathedral of Crabs, and we see these little crabs. They're quite small. We see these little crabs delicately peeling back the seaweed from your finger. Carefully, delicately, reverently. And we see them taking their tiny little claws. And if you let them, they're going to just scrape out bits of flesh from the wound that the elder made when he cut your finger tiny little bits of skin and subderma and they collect it in their claws and they eat it and they gather around your arm and your hand in a way that i can only describe as almost like a like a, like, like they're like they're sitting at pews your hand is like the, the altar, right? And they will want to nip at the flesh of your hand to expose more of the blood and the flesh. And if you let them, they will. Do you? Um, does it hurt? Uh, yes, but not like in a like cry out in pain way. More mm -hmm. of just like a you know sharp. Sure. Like like if you get you know stuck with a needle or something. Um, I think, um, yeah, I do let them. Uh, I'm sort of taken and by the strange like, um, sort of like the the level of care that you wouldn't expect from like an animal to take uh, at such a task and like coordination um, from like these little crabs. Um, to the point that I allow it to continue, um, but perhaps there's a, a number of them that come that it becomes scary or um, concerning, like maybe the, they'll take too much. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's peaceful. Mm -hmm. 
it is, um, I mean, it's to the point where you're not even aware yeah. of the rumbling of thunder overhead, right? Mm -hmm. There might even be a shaft of light piercing through the gray clouds, <laughs> illuminating the space. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe force uh, um, for it so, uh, sort of has like a like a divine connection moment or something, you know, um, yeah. feels like a moment of purpose. Milo, for it is so caught up in the fugue state that they have missed, uh, they have missed a, what appears to be a satchel, an oil skin satchel near the boat. If you collect it, it has a few things in it, hooks, diving fins, rope, but also a small bottle of wine, a wedge of cheese and dried fish. Do you take it? I take it and I, uh, and I, and while I'm taking it, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get for it to, to, to stand up. Come on, we gotta go, we gotta go. As you're collecting the satchel, you hear the gulls overhead. It is a gift from the sea, a gift from the sea. The queen of tides gives, but the queen of tides takes. And now there's a crash of lightning and thunder. For it, you are snapped out of your reverie. The crabs scatter, Hiltrude. The young woman says, we should find shelter. Um, yes, of course. I, first of all, can I just say, I love crab commune. That's great. Crab communion. That's perfect. Um, did I see her, her partner, assumed partner, um, on those boats, did did she get on those boats? Uh, that was or her mother, actually. Her mother. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't and, well, ask. Well, I, didn't, so I didn't. I didn't, yeah. I didn't specify it actually, but it was her, <laughs> fact, her mother. Okay, um, but uh, no, she didn't get on the boats. No, she didn't get on the boats. Okay, um, I was I was thinking I wanted to comfort her mm -hmm. um, as we as we kind of make our way to cover to find try to find cover further inland of the island or perhaps a cave. Mm -hmm. um, could I? perhaps use like um vigilance saying i'll keep an eye out or i was going to use deception saying that you know her mother was fine but um her mother is fine so that's not really deception <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean i kind of like the idea of i kind of like where you're going with this and i think to sort of lean into that or to go with it we'll say that she was on the boats and she okay. did get <laughs> taken oh, no. by the sea so now you can have your. <laughs> oh no, I've doomed her in my questioning. Okay. Yeah, you can have your, but but I think this is a good like reduction role moment because you're lying, right? You're kind of yeah. Like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Works for me. Yeah, and uh, basically the, the the reduction role will just be if she realizes you're lying, right? So, okay. So um, can I do that then? You could please do. What do you say? Um, I tell her. Um, you know, I say um. Crap. It's not what I say to her. That's just my role. Um, I tell her, um, dear, I, I, I know that the, uh, the woman, uh, older woman who was crying over you is safe and sound. So take some solace in that. We will um, find her, reunite you, and all will be well, I promise. I got a six. <laughs> there is a look of a look of a blank expression on her face and she says I think we should find cover from the storm and she pulls away from you and goes deep into the tree line to try to find cover the wind is picking up quite intensely now, Milo, for it, Hiltrude. I will. Take, you should take cover. Yeah, I will warily follow. Um, try to keep a distance. I feel I screwed up. Um, a little bit. Yeah. You all take whatever cover you need to take.
as our the camera of our movie or whatever pulls away as you're all cowering for cover. We're moving out across the beach. We see a beached whale, fins and tails tangled in seaweed, desperately trying to get back to the water, but it can't. We see an abandoned cottage that looks as if it has stood there for centuries, ripped from its foundation and tossed into the ocean. And we go deep into the water where we see a skull wedged between a pair of rocks. Seaweed hair flowing in the tide. So passes ring two and that completes our session for the evening as well. Let's do our debrief. Stars and wishes is the debrief we're gonna do. Stars are things you enjoyed uh, about the story, either a specific story moment or just anything your fellow players did, anything I did, just something you enjoyed or many things you enjoyed. And wishes are things that you hope to see in the story next week. Um, whoever wants to go first, take it away. I uh, liked uh, experiencing the, uh, the the festival as it started to turn turn dark, and uh, uh, as a uh, as a as a traveler, um, I, I think uh, I think Milo has seen some things and tries to stay open. But uh, it's hard, to, you know. It's really hard to stay open when you know, you know, it's, it, this may be against somebody's will, and and so the 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 turning the the festivities turning dark. Uh, I think is probably where I would put a star. Yeah, that's where I put my star. And you don't have to just do one. You can do as many stars as you want. I don't want to to be clear. It's not a star. A star. <laughs> many stars as you wish. Uh, I'll say. I'll say. My, I'll say some stars. I um. I also. I love the ring one. Uh, ritual festivity scene i thought that was great it had very very strong wicker man vibes very strong midsummer vibes very um it was just very that you know and i was very very here for it and i and i, I particularly enjoyed like because i knew when i was getting ready to turn up the horror dial you know and i and i was liking the reactions i was seeing on your faces so that made me very happy um i'll probably have some other stars in a moment but that's just one i wanted to throw out um, yeah, Jason, I think you did a great job of uh, really creeping us out. <laughs> That's a star for sure. Um, I, I would definitely have to say that that my the stars go to the animal um, uh, rune effects of the the crab communion and the mocking birds and the way. Uh, that Milo uh, reacted to all of all of that, and um, just everybody's. I'm, I'm really, too. yeah, yeah. I'm really digging that it's it's these horrors to us, but it's second nature to them to to the to the characters already. Like we're like, oh my god, that's so weird, and they're just like, yeah, this is this is a Tuesday for me now. I talk to birds. I I get eaten by crabs, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I think is, it speaks to something really interesting about the game, which I always tell people, which is we're basically getting these characters like we start with these characters three quarters of the way through their story, right? Like we're basically getting them right at the end of their story. And and so they have seen some shit, you know, they have done some stuff. And I think that kind of puts the ambiguity of it that I think is uh, the, 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 the what's ever in the mists of the past is what makes it interesting, you know? I, I like the uh, the character combos. Um, I've not ever seen this character combo before. Um, a smuggler, you know, a, a cultist, a medium, and a and a peddler. Uh, you know, it, it's it's it, I can see them like thinking that this is going to be an easy score. We're, we're just going to get like it's like a, the prequel. They're they're talking about it's just going to be treasure on the beach as much as we can pick up, and and then I can see the, the as it sinks in that. That this is going to go in a in a in a totally different way. That that's that's cool to see. I'm going to start for um uh, start for Michael for the way, I think the way you played into the emotion of that scene with the one on the beach. Um, 
that was great. Uh, I really liked it. Um, it was fun to play and it was fun to sort of see. It was fun to like think of my reactions to what you were doing. That was really enjoyable. And it was fun to see you react to that. Um, and I thought everybody did a really good job with just like, you know, it's a little tricky, like when you kind of don't know these characters very well, you have to kind of like immediately get to a characterization like really right away, right? And I thought you all did a pretty, you know, a really good job of like kind of slotting into like your character's lane, you know, and doing the thing you were gonna do, uh, which I thought was great while still leaving some space for it to sort of like be, to feel out. I appreciate that Ryan pushed for the danger by trying to open, like opening the box, the seals in the box, right? And, um, and I like the, uh, I liked the sort of, um, there was almost like a bit of levity in the way that Daniel was playing with the birds, which I thought was really intriguing, um, which I think just made the whole situation, the absurdity of it almost made it like more scary in a way, so yeah. Um, one thing I'm looking forward to more is more character to character interaction. Um, I think just with the nature of us not knowing each other, it's probably a little harder at first, but um, next session. Um, Doing a little bit more of that would be good. I would like to see like the massive treasure, right? Like I, I, I like to see like what is this? What is this? This massive treasure, and then the flip side, right? The other side of the 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 opposing force of the of the treasure. Like what massive thing is the is the is the queen of the tides going to throw at us uh, to keep us from getting that treasure? My wish is for the foreshadowing of the sunken watchtower to make an appearance later on. I think it'll be fun. I was thinking with that last statement, uh, it was like uh, the crab from Moana, where you just, you know, you see all this treasure and then it just rises up and you're like, oh no. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to more than anything. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. Um, I, I'm 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 interested in seeing more backstabbing as people try to stay away from the grasp of of uh, of of the uh, the sea, but also like I already have in my head what I want to do when I'm completely consumed, and it's it's there and it's going to be great. And I love it, and uh, I think that I think going into that means that this whole system is just so unbelievably unique in that aspect they lose <laughs> you're already playing to lose it's good that's right yeah. you, can't really, lose, you can't lose too early ring two is too early right yeah <laughs> i really like the um the ruin and reduction system i think that that is very cool how you get really close to the edge and then you can work your way back but in more interesting ways i think that's great yeah same i also uh, my other wish is i hope we get to see a contest roll uh, contest roll usually happens in ring five uh, because there's there's usually some reason why only one character can have the treasure, you know, and so you have to do the contest roll to see who gets it. I, and it's always like a, it's always a big like operatic, like spiral down the, you know, down the hole of destruction, <laughs> right? So uh, even though you might get the treasure, you are like you know so uh that's always gonna be fun i, I hope but we may not have that moment but i hope we do so we'll see um any other stars or wishes before we go okay well in that case um i'm gonna stop the recording <laughs>